Hello, my name is Jonah Jonathan and welcome once again to the Jazz Musician's Voice. Tonight I'm presenting an interview I conducted with jazz pianist, a living legend, Johnny O'Neill. We sat down at the office of Smalls Live, and we thank Spike Wilner for that, to talk about Johnny's life in the music. Johnny has worked with the who's who in jazz, and uh, in the interview we talk about many things and one particular interesting story that I'll share with you right here is the first day that Johnny got to New York Barry Harris introduced him to the Thelonious Monk which is a really fantastic thing and they played together in the Baroness's house which is just a brief example of all the great stories that Johnny shares with us and the other thing I'll mention is that this is one of the first times that Johnny comes out on camera talking about his illness and um, his issues with his health. And uh, if you guys watch this interview and you feel like helping out, I'll be posting a link for that. So please help Johnny out because we cannot afford to lose these living legends. And, you know, Johnny has gone through some difficult times and we need to help encourage him and help him financially so that he gets better. Um, he's lost a lot of weight and he, he need, desperately needs a hernia operation, but he needs to regain his health. So please support Johnny in that and please watch this interview to its full entirety. I know it's very long, but if you get a chance, make sure you do so because this guy is really talking about some important things in this music. And um, if you haven't subscribed to the Jazz Musician's Voice, please make sure you do so. There's so many exciting interviews coming up and performances. And uh, we've recently passed 1,000 subscribers and 100,000 views again. Actually, if you really count everything, it's actually more than 200,000 views. But um, I'm just excited at all the things that are going on because... We're here at Montreal Jazz Festival, and we're getting some interviews with jazz legends that will be coming up very shortly. So we encourage you to continue watching, and thanks for tuning in. And Once again, I'm Jonah Jonathan signing off. In my generation of musicians, um, there are particularly two musicians that I think of who are probably the most naturally talented of all the musicians I know in, in my age group. And uh, they both happen to be from Detroit. One of them is Kenny Garrett, um, the well-known saxophonist. The other one is uh, pianist Johnny O'Neill. And uh, I think Johnny is, is is probably the most naturally talented pianist that I, I know. I met Johnny about 28 years ago in a Memphis piano store. And I walked in and he was playing the piano and it caught my ear. 
And I thought, well, this can't be anybody from Memphis because anybody who plays this great from Memphis, I would already know it. And um, there's so many outstanding things about Johnny's uh, playing, but um, uh, two or three of the most outstanding things is number one, the touch. Johnny's got a million dollar touch. I mean, uh, very few people touch the piano like that and get that kind of sound and feeling out of it. And uh, the other thing is his uh, feeling of swing, which is, uh, I've always thought was so natural. And, um, and then there's Johnny's personality that comes out in this playing. It's, you know, so engaging. And uh, Johnny can play a ballad like few people, if any. And so I, I've just always held his talent in the highest regard. And I think he's a very special, special artist. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, today I have the wonderful opportunity to interview the legendary, world-renowned pianist, vocalist, composer, educator, Johnny O'Neill. Now, uh, Johnny, for people who are not familiar with your background, can you tell us a little bit about how you initially got involved in music and your family roots? Well, I tell you, my background is hereditary. My dad was a pianist, and actually I didn't hear him until I was 13 years old. I heard him at a house party, and uh, I heard him play Erskine Hawkins after hours. And I was so fascinated with my dad playing piano, so I said, Dad, I want to learn how to play. So I come home from school, maybe a month later, he had bought me my first upright piano. And he told me I had two choices, either I'm going to play it or eat it. So, uh, and I was raised, prior to that, I was raised on jazz because he was a great, very good entertainer. I'm junior, by the way. So I was raised up on all the great classics, and I didn't like jazz in the beginning. I was from the church. The gospel was my background. And uh, so when I started really to play jazz, it was easy for me to play it because I grew up hearing all those records as a kid, yeah, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, th that's so amazing and, and you, you know, you really came up in one of the uh, top places for the music, you know, Detroit. Detroit, you know. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, coming up in Detroit, um, you know, I, I know you started playing in the uh, New Bethel Baptist Church when you Bethel. were like, well, that was one yeah, of the few, that yeah. was one of the most gratifying was now that I look back at it, you know. And you know, it's really something that, it was just for a short while, and I never got a chance to meet Aretha while, when I was there. And I was in, still in high school when I played there at uh, Bethel Baptist Church. Yeah, in Detroit. but that was Aretha, Aretha's Sunday. father, right? Uh-huh. No. Uh -huh. Yeah, Re Reverend Franklin. And, uh, you know, who were some of the cats that you hung out for? and learn from during that time in Detroit, you know, because there must have been a lot of guys. Well, I was pretty much, I was the most regional called gospel player at the time, so I used to get called to do a lot of gospel stuff. Like, yeah. I rec in fact, in 1973, I won for best gospel pianist, James Cleveland Piano uh, uh, Night that they used to have during the gospel workshop. Wow. So I was yeah. into the gospel really strongly back there at that time, you know. And I remember when I left Detroit, I left Detroit uh, in 75. I came back to Detroit, I was playing jazz in 76. Cause my very first jazz gig actually where I started to play jazz was in St. Louis, Missouri. That was my first jazz gig. Wow, yeah. I played there six nights a week plus a Saturday matinee hundred dollars a week but that was a lot of money in those that's a lot days. of money back then back you know. then uh-huh so that that must have been an amazing experience you know and, and when i came back to detroit they said man o'neill is playing jazz people but I, it, it was easy for me because i could remember a lot of the stuff tunes stuff that i heard it on recordings and stuff you know sure, sure. and my dad was a great avid of being a melody person the treatment of the melody in fact he used to make me sit and just play the melody. He said, why are you embellishing that? The melody is pretty by itself. He would scream at me if he hear me embellish that melody. I mean, like one the tune comes to mind, sophisticated lady. Oh man, 
he made me play that too, especially the bridge. Yeah. He was always adamant about the melody. And wow. also, he used to always, he was very uh, strict about, he said, I think, Johnny, if you learn how to accompany, you would get more gigs and it would put more weight to your playing as a piano player. And you would always work, singers always looking for a good piano player, you know. So and that's really your your first real lesson, you know, your first teacher is your father, and that's that's uh, wonderful. And you know, that for you some reason, I've played in front of a lot of the great musicians, but it was something about my father's presence. He, I used to be so nervous playing in front of him, because he would tell me what he would think. He said, "Yeah, baby, you got a little shaky up in that bridge, huh? What I told you about embellishing that melody." So at that time, it used to really bother me, but I'm so thankful today that he, you know, he instilled all those kind of ingredients in my mind and, you know, in my creativity. And I give him a lot of credit. My dad was really my biggest mentor musically. Wow, that's really, you know, I mean, it's really fantastic that um, you had someone so close to you kind of guiding over you and mm -hmm. teaching you about the music. And, you know, it's, it's cool that you were a gospel cat because, you know, a lot of the great jazz pianists came out of that gospel scene, you know. Mm -hmm. Cats that come to mind, that, you know, Hank Jones, for example, or, you know, Mulgrew Miller, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and you yourself, you know. The gospel music, I, I'm sure it kind of gave you guys a whole um, concept of melody that people normally wouldn't get. And it's such a high level of spirituality. One thing, two things is hard to follow. It's gospel and blues. I don't care who you are. You cannot follow it, you know. And gospel is where you really learn a strong rhythmic way of playing. Um, and it helps you with dynamics. See, when I come up playing gospel, at that time, they didn't have all the instrumentation as they do now. It was just the pi upright piano, the sisters with the tambourines on two and four. Yeah. And so I had to play for a 50-voice 50 voice choir. So I had to be the whole orchestral. I had to play the whole left hand because people ask me, well, how did you develop such a strong left hand? I have to say playing gospel. Because we didn't have, we didn't use bass players, so I had to be the, play the bass line. Imagine a 50 voice choir yeah. on an upright piano. Wow. Yeah. So that's what kind of gave me my endurance and my strength, you know. So when you were in the church, um, you played some organ too? Oh yes, I'm a B3 player as well. Uh -huh. That's cool, man, you know, because uh, a lot of cats, um, you know, they either play B3 or they play the piano. There's I play both, like but that, now, you know? currently now, it was more back then, they didn't have no uh, choice of uh, what instrument you can play either one, but now it's more organist now. You get paid more now. They look more yeah. for organists now these days than they do for pianists. And if they use pianists, they use more like electric pianos and stuff, you know. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so when you were in St. Louis, uh, you must have been exposed to some great cats over there. like. Yes, well, believe it or not, I remember when I was playing with the Kenny Gooch Quintet, Miles came in one night. Wow. And uh, he came up and played a few songs with us. And someone yelled from the audience, play around midnight. He said, well, pay me, well, you know. Yeah, yeah. So that was really gratifying to play. You know, looking back at it, and I said, wow. He just sat in. You know, plus his bro I got to know his brother, Vernon. They look like identical twins. You cannot tell them apart. And his brother was very talented. He could sing, like, in seven different languages fluently. Wow. And he was a wonderful pianist. But he had the longest fingernails. His piano lid was all scratched up. He had Freddy Krueger oh, fingernails. Oh, yeah. You know, Ver Vernon is an Vernon, interesting yeah. cat, you know. <laughs> He's really something, you know. You know Miles talks about him. I got to know him a little bit. The book, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, you know, uh, yeah, it's amazing that, you, you know, to play with somebody like that at such a young age mm -hmm. and be able to, you know, hang with those cats in St. Louis, I mean, Coming back to Detroit, that must have made you somebody, you know, oh, big yeah. shot. Oh, yeah, I mean, you know? <laughs> that, all the, that was the talk of Detroit in 76 when I came back. It was because I lived in St. Louis in 75. Yeah. So at that whole year playing six nights a week, and those were some very hardcore musicians that I was playing with. They all were older, and I was like the baby in the band, you know. And sometime I remember one night, the, the drummer, who was, which was the leader, 
he would call them breakneck tunes like all God's children got rhythm. You got the first solo, Johnny. Oh, Lord. Listen to Bud Powell. They used to make me listen to certain recordings and stuff. You know, although I was exposed to it, you know, but, you know, I used to always get featured a lot. They really saw, I guess, a talent in me, you know. And I enjoy, actually, that was really one of the most gratifying schools for me. Yeah. Playing in the Kenny Goose, that was my. Wow. Yeah. People are always surprised when they tell they would think Detroit, but St. Louis is where I had really my jazz career began in St. Louis. Cool. And cool. it went on from there. And you know, and then uh, in Detroit, um, you know, at that time it must have been the Motown scene. Were you ever involved with no, any I of that? No, I never. I come, you know, Motown was in the 60s. I come to the 70s, so I missed that period. But I knew a lot of the Motown musicians, and, you know. Sure, sure. And, uh, and I tell you, and, a lot, and pl people don't know this, but a lot of those Motown musicians back then, they were all jazz players. That's why we have such a definitive sound. And a lot of these musicians try to capture that, but they were jazz musicians yeah, that made yeah. no money. Thirty, forty dollars for a record date, you know that was pretty good money crazy, back man. then. Yeah, one of my favorite uh, session players, James Jamerson, man. James Jamerson, uh -huh. you, you know him at I all? I got met him, uh huh. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. and um, did you see that big thing they did on Motown? Now? Yeah, they just did something on Motown, uh -huh. which is cool, you know. And, and actually, the drummer that played on a lot of those Motown records, Pistol Robert Allen, he played in my trio for quite a few years in Detroit. He was one of the main house drummers on the Motown scene at that time, you know. So tell us about some of the clubs in Detroit, because, uh, you know. Well, of course, you know, still currently, Baker's is the oldest jazz club in the world. It's been there since 1932. Wow. It, never, it only closed at one period for about two months, but it, it was always consistent. Now, of course, you know, all the greats of greats played at Baker's, from Art Tatum, the list just goes on and on. Sure. In fact, Art Tatum picked the piano that was there at Baker's. Wow. You know, and I always used to, when I was young, I said, man, I would love day to play at Baker's one day in the future. And I find I wound up playing there with a lot of the names. They would come to Detroit when, I heard, when they heard I could play jazz. I played there with Johnny Hartman, Sonny Stipp, the list just go Kenny Burrell. In wow. fact, Kenny yeah. Burrell, we used to do every Thanksgiving weekend it was a Kenny Burrell with the Johnny and the old trio. Kenny Burrell, the list goes on and on. In it's Detroit. fantastic, so yeah. That was great to be at home and play with a lot of the names. They would always request me to play piano. You wow. Know? wow. So that's where I got a lot of that experience. A lot of times I was nervous and stuff, but they loved me, you know. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. and I learned so much being on the bandstand. And back then, it, as it is now, they, you didn't say, if they asked you if you know a tune, say, I don't know it, you were here at one. You they didn't allow no music and all that. You had to learn right on the spot. So that makes you retain more information. Yeah, you know? and you, you, you know, we'll talk about that later because you, yeah. you got an encyclopedic knowledge of, of jazz tunes and, and, and lyrics, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but, you know, being in Detroit, um, how did you make the transition? I know you moved to... Uh, to uh, Alabama eventually, right? Well, after high school, I went to Alabama. Oh, okay. And uh, I remember very vividly, I went down to stay with my grandmother. So I was wandering downtown one day, and I saw this restaurant uh, that had a piano in the window. So I walked in there, um, and I said, and I asked the guy, could I play? Actually, that was my profession, first professional gig, but not as a jazz player. Because yeah. I always new standards. So I asked him, could I play? He hired me right on the spot. It was a place called Cafe Italiano. Okay. And yeah. so he hired me uh, to play uh, uh, Wednesday through Saturday from 8 to 12. That was actually my first professional gig. And at that time, it was still kind of segregated a little bit. A lot of blacks started coming in the morning, and I got fired. You know, yeah, yeah, I did. It's the truth. It's and, interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I left uh, Birmingham, Alabama, that was before I went to St. Louis. You see? Oh, okay. You know. So that's even uh, early spot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I know. Uh, you know, ninety-seven. I was playing at Duke Ellington. You know, doing a restaurant, doing a Duke Ellington and 
sat down, don't okay, get around yeah. much anymore that, kind of that stuff. restaurant. Yeah. yeah. But I knew all those tunes. I was raised on it. So that was gave me the opportunity to experience a lot of the stuff that I grew up with as a, yeah. as a youngster, yeah. you know. And you ran into, I'm sure you ran into a lot of cats down there that, uh, you know, you, you met later on, you know. Met later on, uh-huh. Yeah. In fact, I got d inducted back in 98 in the Alabama Jazz Hall of Fame. Which was yeah. a, a quite surprise. I had no wow. idea I was being inducted. Well, that, that's they got fantastic. my picture in the museum, and you know, where Ella Fitzgerald and Nat King Cole and all. That was really one of the first uh, jazz hall of fames. They they never really. It's not no. It's not as notable no, notable as uh, a lot of other ones. But that's one of the original uh, jazz hall of fame. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know that's a. Uh, it must have been an honor to be really inducted and, and held to that esteem. Oh yes, it was. But it you know, was. you are you are a living legend. So you know, we we'll, we we'll get into more stuff. You know, um, you you uh, moved to uh, New York I in seventies, the late seventies. How did well, that? Well, actually, I'm gonna tell you, it's really interesting because people have asked me how it was my association in New York. The very first time I visited New York, I had met. Barry Harris prior to coming to New York, and I, I met him in Detroit. He was playing with Harold Land and Blue Mitchell. And I went, in fact, I went to Barry Harris's house when I was about 14. So people told me to go visit him. So I took the bus, I remember it was 20 below zero. I took the bus all the way on the east side. Barry answered the door, I said, I'm Johnny O'Neill. He said, come on in, young man. And he had me sit down and play the piano. He tells people that I could play when I was 14. He said, Johnny was playing great. But I don't really <laughs> think of myself as a jazz player. I'm just thinking of stuff that I grew up with. So I told Barry, I said, well, I heard him in Detroit at a club with Harold Land and Blue Mitchell. I said, I'm coming to New York in a couple of months. He said, when you come to New York, I have a surprise for you. Mind you not, my very first visit. So I called him. I said, Barry, I'm coming to New York. He said, well, meet me on Central Park West. Of course, I got lost. I drove my car. It took me forever to try to find him, but he was there waiting for me. He said, I got wow. a surprise. I didn't know what the surprise was. Yeah. He took me over to Jersey. He introduced me to the, you know, uh, the Baroness. He said, Monk, he went and got Monk out of his way. He said, I want you to hear this young man play. Wow. I mean, that that's just a, a dream come true, man. Yes. You know, but if you look back at the times like this, you don't realize how significant and stuff that is until you get older. I went, wow. My very first visit, I hung out with Monk all day. We sat and played. And you know, and I noticed he had the most unusual way he played flat finger, you know. That's how he got the sound. It looked like his fingers would be tripping over each other. Interesting. You know? And he told me, he said, man, you got a magic touch, man. I really like the way you play it, blah, blah, blah. Barry said, I told you you would dig this young kid. It was great. He, he was so, a lot of people always thought he was eccentric. No, he was a well-mannered, well-spoken guy, more like a fatherly type of a guy. And you know, by the way, we share the same birthday as well, October 10th. Oh, that's cool, man. Uh -huh. So that's a, you know, that's definitely something, you know, I know uh, at some point somebody had, had remarked uh, with, with Oscar Peterson also that, or not Oscar Peterson, uh, Art Tatum, Mm -hmm. That you were born right after Art Tatum's passing. Right, yes, yeah. So, you know. And you know, when I left, uh, when I, so when I came to New York, that was my first visit. So not long after that, I, uh, I got the gig with Milt Jackson. Now how this came to be, I was playing a hotel gig, because at the one time I was doing, Top 40 was really, really, really huge in those days. A lot of the hotels used to do show bands and stuff. Sure. So I was playing a, uh, in Gary, Indiana. I've always wanted to meet Ray Brown because I grew up on his records. So that Sunday night, he he was there the whole week, but I was off that Sunday. So I said, I'm going to go down to, uh, down to the Jazz Showcase in Chicago. I'm going to go down and introduce myself to Ray. And I look back now, I had a lot of nerve at that time. When you're young, you just yeah, you're ballsy, yeah. <laughs> you know. I walked up to Ray Brown. I said, Mr. Brown, I'm a piano player from Detroit. I said, can I sit in? He looked at me like, no, we don't have sitting in the policy. We don't have sitting in. So what I did, I waited till the whole set was over, 
Ray had packed up his base, went in the dressing room. I sat around, you know, like we hang out late night. I went up and started playing the piano. Um, Ray peeped around the corner. He saw it was me. He came out of the dressing room, unpacked his bass, and started playing with me. Wow, that's he said, fantastic. I see, <laughs> he said, I see we have a new young Oscar Peterson on the set. How would you like to do a record? Day? That's how I did my very first album coming out on the Concorder. So it was like a couple of weeks later, they flew me out to California. Initially, the rhythm section was John Clayton and Jeff Hamilton. That was the new trio he wanted to kind of produce. Yeah. But you know, we were young kids, so we was, you know, we was kind of back and forth. We were young, young gladiators, and we didn't want to be told each other. I mean, John Clayton, you know, anyway, that's another story. But so I said, Ray, I would like to do the record date with you. So we came back and we did the record date, and he played on it. And after we did the record date, he said, I'm going to put you with Milt Jackson and Dizzy for some exposure. That's how I got with Milt Jackson. Wow, wow. You know? So sometimes, you know, it pays off to, to step step you out, step out on a limb, you know? Sometimes right. it pays off to be a little cocky if you're going to get You did not get, know that I was way. being that way. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, it's amazing that you got to to be on a record with, you know, the great Ray Brown, you know, and, and that he would And that was in his prime, you, you, you know. know. Yeah. And, you know, and I tell you, in fact, it was a double record day because it was Jimmy Rose. We recorded back to back, you know, and Ray Brown, man, I tell you, it was, you know, I look back at it and I said, well, I had the nerve and courage to play with a master like this. You don't think like that sometime when you're young, you know. Yeah, you just go up, you know. You just go up and do it, you know. Sometimes it's better to have that kind of innocence, yeah. that, you know, where you don't. Because, you know, after a while you've been on the scene and, you know, you maybe got vibed by a couple of cats or whatever happens, you know, you kind of get timid. But if you're a young cat, you don't have any of that. You don't have that right that holding you back. So it's just it's great that it paid off in the right way for you, you know. But, you know, I tell you, the first gig I did with Mill Jackson, I was so nervous. It was gig in Milwaukee at the Jazz Gallery. His first words to me, which I'm a gee impersonation of his look, he said, you don't play that off shit, do you? <laughs> said, no, no. I, you know, he didn't really know my plan. And I remember when we played the first couple of two, he said, yeah, okay. You know, and I, then I toured with Mill for about a year and a half, you know. Yeah. With the real, it was Mill Jackson, Ray Brown Quartet. Sometimes it would be Billy Higgins. We had a lot of Mickey Roker. So, I mean, I come up in the rim of that. And I look back now, I said, wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. And what what year was that? This was a 80, uh, 81, 82, right okay, before I yeah. moved to New York. Right before you came to New York. Mm -hmm. So, you know, by the time you got to New York, you, that was your calling card already. That was my you calling know? card. And how I came to New York to officially live in New York, I played with Clark Terry, which I have a re recording with him. It's called Owl. I played with him the whole weekend in, in Atlanta. I had went to Atlanta with Bill Jackson. And the club owner liked me there, so he started bringing me in as to do my own trio. So Clark was the guest for a week. So Clark came and played with the, played with the, my trio. So I told Clark uh, that I'm getting ready to move to New York. I moved to New York March of 80. He said, well, when you come to New York, give me a call. Really strangely enough, the time I decided to go to New York, I took the Amtrak from Atlanta to New York. I arrived in the mid-afternoon, I get a village voice. I saw where Clark Terry was appearing at the Blue Note. The Blue Note was relatively new at that time. They were just starting to bring names in. So I called Clark Terry up. I said, Clark, this is Johnny O'Neill to play with you in Atlanta. I said, who's working with you this week? You are. Oh. The day I moved to New York, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I moved to New York, which was on a Tuesday. I got here around 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I opened at the Blue Note that whole week with Clark Terry. I'm playing on a Saturday night. Someone comes up from behind me. This is Art Blakey. I want you to join my band when next week we're going to Europe for three months. That's, I got the gig with Blakey the first week I moved to New York. Wow, wow. And he had just put a new band with Terrence Blanchard, Donald Harrison, and Butch Billy Pierce was the oldest member of the group. And that's when I joined Blakey and we went to Europe. So I didn't even get a chance 
to enjoy to hang in New York. In New York, yeah. I left and went on the road for three months. Wow, I mean, so you know, just coming to New York, you already became a messenger. You know, already the first week. Yeah, I mean, that's, find that's fantastic. One of the most, yeah, they call that a real success story. Yeah, that you is. Know? I mean, the, I mean, most of the cats who come here, man, they got to be here a long time before they even get noticed. You know, and you know, and I tell you, man, art. Everybody tells me they said, man, art loved you, old nigga. He said I was one of his favorite piano players. He used to give me so much play. He said, right now I want y'all to hear one of the greatest young piano players. And well, sometimes he would feature me a half an hour solo piano. On wow. The, you know, I, yeah. sometimes the guys used to, I didn't know if they was jealous or something, but he showed, he showed a, a lot of love because he always had a love for the piano himself, you know. And that was one, and one great thing about playing with Blakey, it, it enabled me to be more of an ensemble and being able to be a team player because I was used to playing quartet. And then it was mandatory and necessity to write, okay, I'll nail the next rehearsal. I want you to bring in two new tunes. So it enhanced your writing skills. And at the time, I'm self-taught. Yeah. So I didn't know how to really write the charts out. So I would just play the part. I always could knew, knew the parts. And Terrence said one time to me, I said, man, don't you learn how to read where you write this stuff? I said, no, he's just a natural. Let him do it his way. You know? <laughs> Terrence used to get mad because it was so time consuming because I would sit there and play all the yeah. parts. You know, I knew what I wanted to hear, so I had to bring in a couple of original tunes. And the thing about Blakey, which is different now, at that time, Art never took it upon himself as a band leader. When we would have rehearsal, he said, okay, guys, what you got? Show me how that damn thing go. <laughs> and he would call, the, we would have a rehearsal, we may have a gig that night, yeah. oops, yeah. and he would, uh, let's play those new tunes we rehearsed. No, we don't know them. He could, ah. I mean, it was sometimes it would be a serious <laughs> trade wreck, you know. But that's how you retain information and doing it right then. You had to remember all it. See, the day is so easy now. These guys have the iPhones and all that. Oh, our, our, one thing Art Blakey did not, he did not allow music on the bandstand. You don't see no music up here. In one of his quotes, music comes from the creator to the artist to the people. You're not playing jazz if you're reading it. You know, he used yeah, to say yeah, that a lot, wow. you know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, thank you so much for uh, giving us some Art Blakey through Johnny O'Neill, because, mm -hmm. you know, us younger cats, man, it, none of these guys hang anymore. And right. most of these guys are not around anymore. So it's, it's so important for us, you know, to get exposed to someone who's been in that and been around that, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I remember with the Art Blakey, um, you know, Benny Green had mentioned to me in an interview we did, he was saying, you know, Johnny's the one who, who brought me to, to art, you know, and he taught me everything, and he's the one who, who hit me to Art Blakey, and, you know, um, tell us a little bit about Benny and, and hanging well, with Benny. Well, you know, I met when I was living in New York. Benny had just moved to New York, so I was one of the first guys to befriend him. You know, Benny used to practically stay, he would stay with me. He used to follow me around to all my gigs. He used to sit next to me on the piano and watch me. Johnny, how you do that, man? So I used to, you know, show him stuff that I could at that time. And so we were, I was in South Africa, that was in Africa with Art Blakey. Betty Carter was in, a, you know, was looking for a new piano player. She asked me to play piano in her band. But at the time, I didn't want to leave Blakey. I said, I got a young man to just come to New York. And he's a very promising, very talented piano player. His name is Benny Green. That's how he got his first break. Wow. I recommend yeah, him, him to Betty Carter. Yeah. That was his first gig, professional gig. Right after that, he got a recorded contract with Blue Note. Yeah. But Betty didn't know him. She went on my recommendation. I recommended him to her, you know? Wow, that's that's fantastic, yeah, that's you know? Yeah, that's, that's, that's really nice, you know? And, uh, you know, he always spoke very highly of you. And, um, you know, it's interesting because all these names are... Uh, um, a mutual theme with Mogu Miller because mm -hmm. when I did an interview with him, you know, you know, Betty Carter was one of the first people that he played with in New York. Right. He came and, yeah, he he came I think he was with Betty in the in around eighty five, eighty six, somewhere around there. Yeah. 
He it was short lived. It wasn't that long. He played with Betty. Yeah, I know. Maybe I, within. I think a it year. actually was. It might have been even earlier, if I'm not mistaken. No, let me see. Yeah, usually I'm good at good timelines. Yeah, because I think he, he he worked with uh, with Betty, uh, right? I think right before Woody Shaw, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. It might have been a little earlier, but you know, maybe you know you know better than me because I wasn't around at that time. But uh, when he left Betty, he went with Tony Williams. Then from Tony to Woody Shaw. Okay, yeah. And he said Woody Shaw changed his whole life harmonically, you know. Yeah. That's where he really felt, he really, really learned a lot playing with Woody Shaw because Woody was so harmonically sound. And I got the opportunity to play with him as well right before he died, actually, in Detroit. Wow, yeah, I mean, uh, Woody Shaw, that's one of the... Uh the real talents that oh, yeah. left us far too soon, you know. Miles always used to say he don't know where Woody Shaw picks all those beautiful notes. He's got the best notes he ever heard. Yeah, yeah. You mm -hmm. know. Mm hmm Well, um the blue note, let's talk a little bit about the blue note, because you, you were the one who really developed the, the sessions over there. I was the first one to start the sessions, because like I told you earlier, they were just new, they was they didn't know name, they didn't know Adam. They didn't have, they didn't know none of the names at that time. So, I used to run the jam session, and I was with Blakey. So, time if we have gigs uptown, I had to rush downtown. I had Lonnie Plaxico, Marvin Smitty Smith, and Jim DeAndres. We did that session. We did that jam session for, for maybe about four or five months. It was short. Then Terry Kirsten took it over and had it for like ten years. But I, st wow. I was the yeah. first one to do the blue. And a lot of people don't know that. And you had some of the top names. Yeah, but at that time, it was yeah. just, you know, yeah. Marvin Smith. Yeah, Marvin Smith is, of course, you know, he's, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's huge one now of the Tonight Show. A good, a good friend of mine um, and mentor, Andy Jaffe, that was one of his students. Uh -huh. he, he's a jazz pedagogist, and he taught him at Berkeley. You know, that's certainly one of the, the top names. And, you know, Lonnie Plaxico, man. Fantastic basis. Lonnie, yeah. Lonnie been, was playing with me off. He used to come up to Detroit and play with me. He was like 18 years old. He would drive up to Detroit to play trio with me. Yeah. And he used yeah. one of his my uh, trio recordings to audition to play with Winton or somebody. He got the gig. He said he, that was an audition tape for him. He sent it to Winton. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, he went with Cassandra after that, Cassandra Wilson, and she's another one. Back in the day, we used to do a lot of little hits. She used to sit in with me and stuff a lot, you know. Cassandra was, uh, she was like one of the real upcoming singers at that time, you know. She was getting a lot of notoriety, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, and, and talk talk to us now about the great Oscar Peterson. Because you opened for him in 85, right? I opened June 24, 1985 at Carnegie Hall. Um, you can begin to imagine. I might as well share this with the public. I was, it was in fact, that, that particular festival, it was the Newport Jazz Festival. It was me, me, Oscar, and Cecil Taylor. I came on and played first solo piano. And I remember minutes before... I came out on stage, man, my knees was literally shaking. <laughs> I was so nervous because yeah. I knew I had to open up. And man, that was the first time I had a friend of mine that was a metaphysician. He said, Johnny, to calm you down, won't you? I had never drank no alcohol. And he said, won't you have a sip of brandy or something to take the edge off? And I remember that was, now imagine before playing Carnegie Hall, hey, I'm going <laughs> to take a drink of alcohol. I took just a little sip. But it did kind of calm me, you know, calm me down a little bit. And I thought, I said, oh, man, this is hard. But I, it made me, it's like <laughs> turpentine. I just took a... You took it, a little sip, yeah. I took a little sip. And I remember when I was, when George Ween introduced me and I walked out on stage, I couldn't look at nobody. <laughs> I walked straight like a, just a robot. I sat down at the piano. I played the first tune. And when I played the first tune, the audience, I told the audience loved it. So if at the end of the day, all we really want is to be accepted. That's pretty much the bottom line. Yeah. yeah. We just want to be accepted for our brilliant efforts or how it depends on where you are at the time. And it was great. And that was, I mean, that was one of the most gratifying 
Kevin Eubanks was there, Ellis Marcellus, and we went and celebrated at the Carnegie Tavern after my concert. Robin, uh -huh. I mean Kevin yeah. Eubanks. And that's when I took, decided to have a drink. <laughs> you know, that's not a success. I mean, nobody, you know. But I'm being straightforward. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, uh, it's uh, <laughs> everybody's got, got their things, you know, and, and man, opening for for Oscar Peterson. Um, tell us how you guys started. How we met? Meeting, and, and I know you were a pro. Well, I used his. to go, when he used to come to Detroit, I used to go see him play, you know. I remember one time I went to Detroit, he was playing at the hotel gig, and I got there early, he was shedding in the banquet room, he, and I walked and I was just sitting there, he said, yes, are you a pianist? I said, no, I didn't want him to know I played, because I wanted <laughs> to hear him just practice. I told him, I said, he said, are you a pianist? I said, no, I'm not, sir. And so he sat there and he was playing, and I noticed I had a chance to hear his practice methods. He did a lot of arpeggios. He didn't practice scales, he did more arpeggios and, you know, and intervals and stuff. You know, so after, I sat there for about 30 minutes listening to him practice. I said, Mr. Peterson, would you autograph, give me an autograph? He autographed my driver's license. <laughs> he sure did. I'm sure you saved that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I still have. He autographed my driver's license. Wow. So um, the second, well, Oscar's been to hear me play a couple of times. He heard me in Toronto, sat right up front. And what was the most gratifying? moment of hearing Oscar, of Oscar being in his presence. He's sitting right up front in the wheelchair. He, he, uh, he's sitting there and when I saw him go, yes, yeah baby, yeah baby, you swing it baby. That touched me more, you know, than anything. I was just like, but see, you don't never, don't try to prove, when people like that come around, don't try to prove anything, just be yourself. Because when you try to prove stuff, then intensity sets in and then you can't deliver. Just be who you are. And artists can detect that if you, you know, I'm not, I wasn't going to try to show up in front of Oscar. But of course, I acknowledge his presence. And then I would give him all the credit and glory. I said, Oscar, you remember you recorded this, blah, 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 did. And I would play a lot of the stuff that I grew up. He was knocked out that I, he can tell that I really studied him and listened to him. So that's when we became pretty good friends, you know, after that. You know? Wow, wow. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing that um, you guys developed a, a friendship and, you know, it's to have like a living idol there. Right. And, and a legend. And, you know, uh, at some point you, you actually made um, Canada your home for a little while. You well, you know, no, I, I, I just spent a lot of time actually. Canada's where I did most of my recordings on a Canadian label. Oh, okay. Uh, which the first label was from Windsor, which is right across uh, on the other side of Detroit. I did about two or three records for them. And then I did on the Montreal scene in Canada. Yeah. And I used to go up and play. At that time, Oliver Jones was a well-renowned pianist. So he was touring a lot. So I used to go up and sub for him for two or three months. And I was playing with the great Charlie Biddles. He had a club, it was a famous club there called Biddles Jazz Club and Ribs, you know. And I played, Canada was really good to me. I have to give a, Canada was, um, I love Canada. I really do, you know. Yeah, it's great. And I work five or six nights a week, you know. Yeah, you know, Canada is fantastic. And that festival up in Montreal is something else, man. You know what? Believe it or not, I've never played the Montreal Jazz. Well, I never played it on my own, but I remember once I did the Ella Fitzgerald uh, Awards and I opened up okay. for and just played yeah. like a 45 minute set. Well, you know, Montreal, if you're watching this, you know, check out Johnny O'Neill. <laughs> well, you know what? But I tell you, Montreal has. One of the biggest, they have like a fifty million dollar budget because you give they give money from all the provinces. Give that they festival is really one of the most largest, hugest festivals. Yeah, yeah. everybody plays that fest, and it's so well organized. You know. Sure, sure. Well, um, let's talk about uh, some of your your recordings. T tell me what we, what's your favorite CD and why, uh, or not CD or record or whatever you want to call it. What's your favorite compilation of music? And why? You know I mean, as far as what do you mean? Uh, as far as as a leader, you know. Well, actually, 
I'm very under-recorded. A lot of people say, Johnny, you don't record enough. If I had to say one of my favorites, oh, it's hard, because I'm so, we are our own worst critics. I, I, if I had to narrow it down, I would have to say, which is not really my CD, is my drummer that used to play when he, it's his record day, it's a recording call, for those who choose to swing. That's one of them, you know, that was a very good recording. Uh, on the Montreal scene was more kind of semi-commercial because I had Russell Malone on it, you know, um, soulful swinging. You know, it's, you, a lot of times when you record, you're never going to really be satisfied as long as you can live with it and it feels good to you. That's what's important. Yeah, Because yeah. you never go catch me trying to want it to be perfect. It's not, you can't think like that. If it feels good and you can live with it, then so let it be. Sure, That's the sure. way I think. Yeah. And you know, and when I record in the studio, I almost like to get to capture the feeling of recording live. I cut the lights down low and try to give an atmosphere, you know. And I try not to think about it when I record. I just let it happen, you know. Sure, sure. Guys, the day now take four or five days to do a record. When I come up, most of all those great classic records you would hear, to, you know, back in the day, those guys did those records in two and three hours. Yeah, nine to five. You know, uh, this is something that uh, Mulgrew Miller was telling me. Uh, he go in the studio with Ron on that, that uh, recording, the Golden Striker. Mm -hmm. They went in. They went in at nine in the morning. They were done by twelve, and Ron had mixed it by one, sent it to Japan. And in, in, in two hours. And they finished that thing in three hours. Oh yeah, that's yeah, the and way. Yeah, mixed they it are. in an hour. Yeah, that's that's right. That you know. That's the, Art Blakey to say, and Art Blakey, he's another one. He didn't like guys in the booth. He liked everybody to be in one room. Sure. I want everybody in one room. Because they, a lot of time back then, they only used one microphone. And listen at the sound uh, that they get captured back then. Oh, man, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. so, that, that, um, so, you know, just to go backtrack a little bit, tell us some stories of, of uh, working with Art on the road. Some gig stories. Well, there was a, you know, I remember, this is one of the funniest stories. I remember we was in Japan, and you know those photographers, they believe in taking pictures, catching you off guard. They got this one where Art was asleep, and someone put a banana over his mouth, and he was like, ah. <laughs> 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 he put a banana in his mouth. Yeah. I wouldn't the hell did that. I, I, you know, he just went off. <laughs> you know, he, um, let me think. Um, Art was, um, he was very protective of his band, you know. I mean, he didn't like you, to, whoever was, and, and another thing people don't realize, Art never really chose the guys to be in his band. He usually leave it up to the musical director, you know. There's only been a few he asked to. I feel honored that he came and asked me to join. But usually the music director always would uh, would pick the guys in the band and stuff, you know. And Art Blakey was an instigator too. Sometimes he would like to instigate conversations <laughs> with the guys. You go let him talk to you like that. Go smack him upside his head, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. I remember mean, one time we were in D.C. And uh, we had just finished the gig. I got in the van, and the road manager could not get out of the damn city. You know, D.C. is hard to get out of that town. Yeah. Art had went to sleep in the van, and about an hour later, Art woke up. We were still in D.C. He said, nigga, we at the damn White House. What the? Somebody smack him up his head and said, I'm going to get a new road manager. You don't know where the F he going. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> yeah, it's, it's but you know, Art used to always want to be brave, and a lot of times when we would go on the road, he'd want to drive. He, I hate to say that he was the worst driver. He would give you a heart attack because he'd be talking and not paying attention. Yeah, but yeah, man, now you got. And I, I said, Art, I said, Art, let me drive, please. Now I've been driving before you was a twinkle in your father's eye, <laughs> and I know he wants somebody to drive, but his pride, you know, he's. He want to be all, you know, yeah. macho and just showing he would be sitting nodding at the wheel. I said, Art, right, you falling asleep. No, I'm not asleep. We'd be zigzagging all over the road. 
And I did a lot of driving in the band at yeah, that, that time. That's a that's a funny one because you know, and it, but also a serious one because uh, you know, everybody has that experience. You know, they're coming home late from a gig, and they're tired, and they they just think they can handle it. You know what it happened out of to me? All myself, the places, you know? the, the, the Blakey, he had. I don't know if it's a nice, good thing to say, but he had a real fear of Philadelphia. It was some about Philly. I think that's where he got beat up there and you know I remember we used to play in Philly let's get the hell out of here and get back to New York it was something about Philly we used to just give him the creeps interesting you know yeah, and that's yeah. something that's something yeah and I remember you know a lot of people don't know that I'm sure you've heard this story Art and Earl Garner was playing together back in the day where Blakey was playing piano and, and uh, Earl Garner was playing drums, and the club owner couldn't stand Art's piano player. So they switched. Earl Garner started playing piano, and Art started playing drums. And that was the beginning of both of them's career. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> no, I didn't. That's uh -huh. interesting. That's yeah. interesting, yes. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for shedding light on that. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk now a little bit about uh, Mulgrew Miller. Okay. Because... Uh, you know, he was just such a great person and musician, and I know he was a good friend of yours. One of my, man, I'll tell you, this is the truth. Mogul and I used to talk on the phone four and five hours. Wow. Fall yeah. asleep on the phone, talk, you know. And another thing, Mogul had, a lot of people don't know that he was silly. He had a hell of a sense of humor about about things, you know. Yeah. And, uh, I remember, I won't, I won't, it'll remain anonymous. But I remember one time, man, we were out. I'll never forget a great story. Mulgrew and I were hanging out at Bradley's. Hank Jones was playing down the street at the Knickerbocker. So Mulgrew and I said, let's go down and catch Hank. Hank saw it was me and Mulgrew. He looked over. He played so, man, he sent me and Mulgrew home. We didn't even talk on the way back. We didn't have, <laughs> and i tell you what tune it was, it was moaning. He reharmonized, da 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 He got to the bridge, da da cha honey. Every chord was a different chord on every beat. <laughs> Mogul and I nearly went up under the table. And Hank like looked around and take that back with your young bucks. And Mogul and I didn't even talk walking back to Bradley's. Hank just spanked us with class and finesse without trying to show a lot of chops, just touch and stuff, you know. Mogul and I always talk about touch, and I really believe what really is the nucleus of a good pianist to me is when you learn how to accompany, because it does, it puts more weight and it makes you develop more of a sound, because you have to sit on phrases a little more and you can't rush them. The reason why a lot of piano players are not singer friendly, because singers can hang your ass, because they may not do a tune in the original key, so you got to transpose readily. And a lot of them don't want to be embarrassed by that. And Mogul and I used to talk about that a lot, uh, being in accompanist and stuff. And that's the way you really get your sound and you, you become much more harmonically sound. And I give a lot of credit and glory to singers. They have really helped my playing a lot. That's why I learned, that's where you learn repertoire, playing with these singers, you know? Sure, sure, I mean, uh and you know, as we mentioned earlier, you have an extensive knowledge of tunes and lyrics. You know, mm -hmm. I love your your voicemail. I said, I said, I don't have a song. Uh, I can't remember. What I don't I have a song right now. Can so you please leave, leave a, lyric? a lyric. Yeah, I love that man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, tell us about your um, your process of learning that many tunes. I mean, you know, more than 1,500 tunes. That's amazing. Well, you know what, but when you really actually think, that sounds like to the average layman a lot of songs, but when you think of an American songbook, that's no tunes. Because I never forget, Ed Thigpen told me once, he said, man, Ella Fitzgerald had a repertoire. He said, over 5,000 tunes that I know of. Perhaps yeah. more than that, that <laughs> yeah. I know of. Yeah. So that means harmonically, she probably didn't sung every chord change imaginable. Sure. You know, the more songs you learn, because they all are different. And you know, and I tell you, if it hadn't have been for the jazz musicians, I mean, 
a lot of these great composers wouldn't be known. They gave those songs long life. We jazz musicians kept made Urban Berlin and all the the twists we would put on their tunes. So learning all those great Urban Berlin, Cole Porter, Richard Rogers, you know, that's where repertoire stems from, you know. Sure. That's sure. why I guess I can say I got. And you know, and I know a lot of songs, and there's still a lot of tunes I don't know. You know, I can't claim to know them all. But Ray, I'm gonna tell you, yeah. someone will tell you they know. Ray Brown say, I know all the effing tunes. <laughs> <laughs> Ray used to say that, yeah. you know. Well, you know, another cat that was, uh, he's a very humble cat, and I know he knows a lot of tunes, Harold Maver, you know. Oh, yeah. That's one of the cats. And Harold was know. never too proud. If it, I've seen him in times, people have asked him, now do something else, I'm not sure that. At least he wasn't too proud. I'm the same way, too, because I don't want to hang nobody out to dry, you know. Because I remember one time, man, this singer came up and asked me of all, some of the most simplest songs can hang you. Like, I'll give you a couple examples. Girl from Nipponi, we play it in a different key. When you got it transposed readily. Yeah. And I remember one time this singer came up and she was toward the end and I was tired. I didn't feel like, I said, I told her I would let her come up and sing. So she called Girl from Nipponi in A flat. We got to that bridge it was a serious train wreck. And her response, she went, oh, oh, God. And so we just stopped the song. We didn't even end it. We just stopped. It yeah. was it was rank. And that was so funny to us. And then we just cried. I love good train wrecks musically. Yeah. Me and Margaret would talk about that all the time. We would get so tickled. And we went out to hear a piano player once. I'd rather not say, that, you know, Rain Anonymous. But he had, we had heard so much about this that he could play like Art Tatum. And Margaret said, people used to say, you gotta hear him, he play like Art Tatum. He, first of all, I just say he's an org, was an organ player. Margaret said he never was so tickled. He said he was driving back to Jersey, I mean back to Pennsylvania. He had to literally pull his car over to the side and just crack up for about 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> he said, man, it was so funny too. Should I say who it is? I, you know, what do you think? I don't want to just explore, but it's a very well yeah. renowned organist. I just leave it at that. Yeah, I leave it at that. You know, yeah. it's always, uh, you know, you never know who's watching. And yeah, know right. <laughs> you know, I don't want to start a bunch of concerts with people, you know. I don't. Yeah, but Mugru, um and I remember which you have a recording, I have a recording that. It's quite delightful when Mogul was the guest. You know, he, he said, you know, I didn't even know he was going to be on it. I didn't even know he was going to be on the DVD. Because we had played, he played a week before I did, and they interviewed him. I had just played the week prior. And so they wanted to interview Mogul. And Mogul just, you know, in fact, I was touched to tears that he gave me a lot of props like yeah. he did, you know. Wow. And, you know, I remember the last time we spoke about two Christmases ago, he used to like to cook. So we was got give, we was like, he was saying, I'm trying to fix this and all this. And I said, Margo, won't you put this? I like to cook, too. If I didn't play, I would be a chef. Because it's an <laughs> art. Yeah. This is having the right temperature, having the right voicings. Cooking is the same thing, man. You have to have a love for it. Yeah. People always think it's... It's the temperature of how you cook food, and you know it's it's like the way you use dynamics playing the piano and stuff. You know, cooking is the same strategy. It's a cookbook, musical cookbook. Cookbook. Most yeah. great musicians. I know a lot of great musicians have a love for cooking. I'm one. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that that's a really uh, fantastic Google, DVD. Bless his soul, yeah. man. Oh man, I, we really lost a great giant man. Sure. Sure. Well, um, let's talk about some of these other masters you've worked with. Mm -hmm. Anita O'Day, Lionel Hampton, Kenny Burrell, Sonny Stitt, you know, mm -hmm. Benny Golson, Eddie Lockjaw Davis. Mm -hmm. Tell us some memorable stories. Some of, some, well, some of those names. Well, Anita O'Day was, uh, I tell you, that was a great experience for me playing with her because her road manager, I think, was kind of her lover too. And boy, they used to just argue on the pants there, you know. I learned, to, in fact, she's another one where I learned a great repertoire 
because she sung all the more, you know, all them unusual, obscure tunes and stuff. So I learned. And the first, actually, the first gig I did with her was at the Carlisle. That was the first gig I did with her. And I wasn't with her that long. Um, actually, she she was like, she was, she, she was a natural phrase. I loved her phrasing. But she used to drink a lot. She used to guzzle down drinks between songs. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have to do to get yeah. an effing drink around here? The waitress be there ready ready to have her vodka given and she was just guzzling it down. <laughs> but she was a sweetheart. She really was. Sure. And Norman Simmons, the great pianist, he the one that recommended me. You know, when you get singers and a p and they, and you get so, like Norman Simmons was well known as being one of the great he used to recommend me to her and that was that was an honor. Because, you know a lot of like I said earlier a lot of piano players are not singer friendly. They play good, which I do respect, but you put them up there with a singer is the real ultimate test. I've seen some great ones, which I won't name, that could not accompany. And I was like, what? You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know. Um, Neat old day, yeah. Man. That's good you mentioned her. Yeah. A lot of people be surprised because she wasn't really, well, she was more known in the 50s and 60s, you know. That's sure. where she made her mark. Um, Talk about uh, Benny Golson. Well, I. it's not a real longevity relationship, but he was our guest with Blakey. And we did a lot of recording in Japan. That's when I first met him, Benny Golson and Freddie Hubbard. Um, and Benny, uh, Benny's uh, motto for me, he calls me world. You know, He thinks I'm one of the best pianists that's living, you know. Uh, and I got to learn a lot of his tunes correctly, you know. Um, I did a couple of recordings with Benny, with Blakey, you know, which I never heard him, believe it or not. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, yeah, the, Benny, Benny Gosen was running a, I mean, I mean, he was really, in, he was, you could put him in a class of, the Ellingtons, his songs will live forever. He wrote some very classic tunes and stuff. You yeah, know? some great tunes, man. You know, uh, Whisper Not, for example. I remember when I first yeah. learned that, I thought I could really play, because I thought that was one of the hardest tunes. <laughs> when I first tried to learn some of Benny Golson tunes. Oh, yeah. Long Came Betty. Killer Joe. Killer Joe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some yeah. great stuff there. And... Uh, you know, it must have been an honor to work with some of these guys. Oh, yeah, and then we were all very good friends. We were all very close, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell us, um, man, you you have what seems like effortless mastery of being able to interpret these tunes and company players and sing, sing these tunes. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice do you have for young pianists who might be watching this who needs a little bit of uh, encouragement or point in the right direction? Well, you know, first of all, it's to learn to have, have discipline. Don't be so braggadocious about your skills. Keep your humility in check. You know, because a lot of, you know, I've seen a lot of, you know, and, and then the thing which really sometimes astonishes me is when a lot of these young players I come up to me and say, I want to pick your brain. But, you know, it's a reciprocal admiration because I hear a lot of the young players today that I want to learn from. I go, wow, what was that? You know, so it's not always about being able to consider it as a legend. You're always open to learn. I'm always open to learn. And I hear some of these young players today that just wow me, man. Just like this young kid here. What's his name? Tuomo. Tuomo, yeah. man. Yeah. He, I love the way he plays. Yeah. So I always, any fool can broadcast as an artist. But it takes a real artist to tune in. You capture so much more when you pay attention. Everybody got something to say. Yeah, yeah. You cannot feel like you have arrived. Music is bigger than us all. You sure, know. Sure. That's my advice for the young people. Always keep an open mind and don't forget where your roots come from. Get some tradition. Some guys just want to play modern and they don't have no extensive traditional background and you can you can tell a lot i could tell right away sure you know sure. a lot of them call them dated no 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 yeah it's harder to play the tradition than it is the modern stuff 
because the modern is more formulas, you know. But tradition is a lot of imagination and creativity, you see. Yeah. And it's your highest level of performance, see. So that's my advice to the young people. Don't overlook the tradition, because that's where, then when you play modern or tradition, it kind of balances your playing out. Because you hear a lot of the guys that play modern, they can't, they don't have no traditional roots. Yeah. Would you agree? You're young. You can hear that. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's that's what, you know, separates cats like you and Mulgrew and mm -hmm. James Williams, you know, from from these younger younger guys who might not have that because, you know, you guys are able to interpret both the old and the new mm -hmm. and combine them together. And in, in my opinion, that's the epitome. That's, that's the epitome. That's, what, of, yeah. that's where it should be, you know. You add your own thing on top of something that's already been built mm -hmm. and you learn all the cats sure. and the influences and mm -hmm. you put that all together and that, that's important you know you know and you know the thing about going back if I may backtrack the one thing about when I was playing with Blakey it kind of enabled me to get more into the modern because Terrence then was writing all as that I still don't understand all that theor theoretical term Phrygian and stuff so it learned me how to play semi modern and stuff. I give that credit to Blakey. It's where my whole, he revolutionized my plan to a certain extent because I hadn't played like that. Sure. So, and I, my advice to the young guys, always keep an open mind. Don't just be closed minded, you know, just want to play modern. Go back to those roots, man. You'll be glad that you did, man. Cause yeah, it, yeah. You know, it gives you more of a flair diplomacy about what you play as an artist. Yeah, people yeah. can hear those strong roots and go, "Wow!" You could tell he's done his homework. You see? Yeah, you know, um, that's a, that's a extremely important. And you know, what's really great about you know what you're doing now for the young cats? You know, you you recently came back to New York. Mm -hmm. When did you come back again? I I've been back in New York. I came back June seventeenth, two thousand ten. Okay, yeah, and you know, I remember when you you first came in, man. One of the one of the things, you know, I, I was playing, and you know, I came off, and you're like, "Yeah, youngster," and I never heard that from somebody before because what you see, there's not too many guys that hang on the scene anymore, mm -hmm. with the exception maybe one of the cats I would run into, uh, aside from music school and Mulgrew and such. One of the mm -hmm. cats was Harry Whitaker. That was I the never only got other to guy. meet him, and he's my yeah. homeboy. I never yeah. got to meet Harry Whitaker. <laughs> Yeah, that was one of the guys that um, was out on the scene, and you know you've sort of uh, taken into the the role right now. And you know, tell us about Small's Jazz Club because you know well, let's you talk know, about this actually, is the Small's office here. You know, speak, you know, speaking of Small, I remember the day I arrived to New York, I got here about one or two o'clock in the morning. I went straight to Small's, and I sat in. And started playing. I played late night. I didn't do no gig. I was just sitting there. I was new on the scene. And I'll never forget Robbie Coltrane was there. He was there that night I came to town. He came up to me and was literally crying. He said, man, I ain't never heard nobody play the piano like that, blah, blah, blah. So about a week or two later, I got to know Spike a little bit. Spike heard me play. Spike said, how would you like to do late night? And Spike hired me maybe about a couple of weeks. He said, why don't I put you on late night? So I used to play from one to closing. And then I suggested to Spike later on, I said, Spike, why don't you let me come on earlier? I said, I think I'd have a better imp. At first, he was a little reluctant. So he decided, okay, I'll give you. Because he, he was doing an early set with him and David Snitty. That was his slot on Sundays. So he switched me. It's all history now. And I yeah. thank him so much for that, you know. Well, you know, thank you so much for coming to Smalls and, and uh, you know, keeping the light alive over there. And, you know, and some see, clubs like Small is some of the most notable places of where some of the great legends played venues like Small. Those were some of the best venues back in the day, you Small know. Small spots, yeah. So I love playing at Smalls. I mean, every Sunday to me, I look forward to it because it's like a mini concert. And I like the closeness. Dizzy was the same way. Dizzy would play all the big concert halls. But if he was still living, I know he would play down in Smalls and it wasn't about the money. Dizzy always liked that 
real atmosphere of being close to the people. I'm just saying, I love it. Yeah, you know, Smalls is a, is, is, is Some one of the Some of the greatest spots, people you know. in the world has walked in that door at Smalls too, you know. Yeah. And, and what Spike is doing, I think, is just remarkable. You know, people always sometimes love to hate you, but they got to give him the credit. Yeah, he will give yeah. you the opportunity to display your wares, so to speak. You have to give him the credit for it. And I want to ask you something, you know, this is this is for uh, for Smalls, you know. Um, they're about to come out with a, a Rocket Hub fundraising project to get a new piano and to uh, to start a audio revenue share thing with a video and such. Mm -hmm. uh, speak to us a few words about why you think that's important, what Smalls is doing. Uh, well, you know, I, I, you know, I'll tell you honestly, I like that piano in Smalls because it's got that real nostalgic, real true. And I'm going to tell you, and I can say this in all fairness, I've played, been in a lot of clubs and heard a lot of live recordings. Smalls, bar none, has the best sound. I love the sound of Smalls. There's no room that record like Smalls. I mean, it is just, I've heard some recordings from now. I went, what? The piano sounds like it's top notch the way it records. That's one of the best recording venues that I that I ever witnessed, that I ever experienced. I got to give it up. It's the best, bar none, you know. Wow. For him wanting to get a new piano, you know, that takes a little time because sometimes you can look up and find real good deals and stuff, you know. But um, I think it's a great idea to do a fundraiser. And I think a lot of people will give, you know, there's not, there's not play haters. You know, you got a sure. lot of sources, inside sources, that will come along and just give money. I really believe that, you know? Sure, sure. But I wouldn't, it's not really no rush. Right now it's really working. Uh, they got a pretty good technician that takes care of the piano. I call it the seven day personality piano because it has a lot to do with the clemency of the weather and mm -hmm. sometimes the humidity and stuff, you know? But for the most part, I enjoy it, I, you know? I look, I look, now you know I must really like it when I look, it's not a gig to me, it is a performance. I look forward to playing at Smalls on Sundays. Yeah, you know? yeah, I mean, well. They're completely different from Smokes and Small. Smokes is more, uh, with all due respect, I love Smoke, but Smokes people, they're not the real avid jazz fans like the people at Smalls, because all your major jazz clubs are in the village, so your avid jazz fans patronize the clubs more in the village. Although I won't say that they don't uptown, but it's people like to take their dates out. That's like a show off. They want to go to a jazz club and go out for dinner. But which Smokes has also, I feel very honored to play there too, because I played opposite a lot of the great names, George Coleman, all the guys, the older guys, Lou Donaldson, all those guys coming to hear me play. And that's just, that is just so touching to me. Lou Donaldson coming. Lou Donaldson, <clears throat> ain't nobody playing like you, man. You got the real thing. Ain't nobody <laughs> playing like you. He said, I enjoy hearing you. I love your treatment of the melodies. You have cats like Lou Donaldson, George Coleman, Her Harold uh, Mavis say, man, you're a harmonic genius. Can't nobody touch your harmony, you know. That's fantastic, you know, to have that and, you know, uh, have some of those but older guys But you don't let it go to your head, you. though. Yeah, You know, yeah. that's the thing about it. As I mentioned earlier, music is bigger than a song. Sure. You cannot feel like you have arrived. Even though I've gotten the accolades as being the king of the piano and all that, when I put the real gladiators on, it keeps my humility totally in check, you know. Sure, sure. I love, you know, of course... Art Tatum, people say you play like Art Tatum. See, the thing about your influences, you capitalize, you, 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 you capitalize on your influences is about your own interpretation. You can't play like nobody. You can conceptually think like them. It's better to think like them than verbatimly trying to play like them. Just like I give you an example, playing solo piano. Let me play a little bit for you on the piano. I'm gonna give you an idea of just a little flair of flavor of the way Art Tatum is interpreted. See, the thing about the piano, the one thing about the tradition, they was ambidextrous. 
most of those pianists back then, the Teddy Wilson, Hank Jones, they all had a left hand. You never tell a piano player he don't ever have a left hand. That's an insult. Because all your great piano players, they, because there's so much activity that goes on in the right hand, so that's where most pianists think to start. But the left hand is like having a good left jab. It sets everything up. Let me give you like an example of like some. Yeah, so thank you so much for playing that for us, you know. And now I wanted to um, ask you, you know, you, you work with some of these really great young cats. Um, you know, your current band is uh, Paul Skivy and, and Charles Gould. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about some of these young guys you've been using. Well, you know, I tell you, it's a kind of a reciprocal admiration because a lot of the young guys kind of throw this youthful kind of vitality and they make they keep me on my toes because they have a different interpretation and I don't take them for granted I don't just like to come across that I'm you know I'm more superior than them no I enjoy playing with them because they they have so much the energy especially Charles Gould man he uh and Paul Sakibi been with me from the very beginning when I first came he was my original bass player and he told me once, he said, Johnny, I learned more from you in these two years than I did going to college for the four years. You know, because he said, I've, t I've taught him a lot of tunes and stuff, you know, and uh, I love having them young, them young kids. Yeah, I call them young lions on board, you know. I can use anybody I really want to because I've had a lot of the name guy. It's not so much about the money. They just want to come play with me, but I enjoy having the young guys and that's what a lot of people thank me for for revolutionizing the whole scene in New York because a lot of people I guess if you want to call it on my level wouldn't want to take the time on use young guys no I don't believe in that the future belongs to the youth well thank you so much for that you know that's it does it belongs to the youth and sometimes them guys put some serious heat under my ass they make they make as Charles Gould Reason why I like him a lot, because he doesn't know any better. And I like that concept, not knowing. That's what creativity comes with, taking a chance, you know. He go, man, we've had some nights, just like in the future, in a couple of weeks or so, finally we gonna got a live recording coming out live from Smalls, you know. And it happened to catch us on a real good night and stuff, you know. I can't remember what songs we played. And you know the thing about playing jazz, for me, I wish I had the discipline. I cannot do a set list. I'm in the moment. I like to play how I feel right then because it's hard for me to go by a set list because it, it always changes. Sure. There's so many great songs, you know. It's still at the end of the day, it's not that you're compromising your skills. It's still show business. And one thing people used to tell me before I ever came to New York and spent as much time. They don't want to hear no blues in New York. Are you kidding? Man, I go to shouting the blues, they get over there more than all the piano player and I'll be playing sometime. They love the blues. One thing about New Yorkers, because it's a high district theater town, they want to hear those show tunes. Then you could do the original tunes. Never forget those show tunes, because that's what sells it. 
At least I know I can say from experience. I, I juggle around different repertoire and see how it works. When I put those show tunes in, no brainer. Trust me. Then you can play the originals. People want to hear what you got to say because they want to hear your own twist of the show tunes, you know? Sure, sure. And then, you know, you sharing the, sharing the repertoire. It teaches and enables these guys to develop a repertoire when they play with a veteran. I'm teaching them a lot of the tradition. And that's why I like, that's your question, is why I like playing with the young people, man. That's I was been, given that great, opportunity, you know. so I'm giving back. And that's, I will that's continue. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much for that, you know. And, um, you know, uh, thank you so much for, for going to these clubs and, and instilling your knowledge on so many cats. You know, that's mm -hmm. important. Um, now I want to talk about uh, something that, you know, might be a little personal and not, not, uh, not so comfortable. But uh, I know that in the past uh, couple years you haven't been feeling so well. Yeah, but you know I have, you know, and I... In a lot of, and I won't blame nobody but myself. Sometimes we could just really be knuckleheads. Uh, but you know, it's really amazing. And I, I still don't understand. When I'm up playing, I don't feel no pain until I come off the bandstand. Because if I felt the pain on the bandstand, I wouldn't be able to play. Sure. I feel no pain, you know. And I think I, I shouldn't be ashamed to go public. I mean, I've had a disease now since. I was diagnosed in 98, Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, and for most of the years I've been undetectable. I, when I came to New York, I started slipping a bit with the late night hangs, not taking my medicine like I should, so my immune system kind of went down, but, and you know, and right now I'm in the process now, because I tell you, this is a chapter that I certainly want to stay closed. I want to get through this hernia, and they can't really do the surgery because of my immune system they scared to risk it you know yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I would advise anybody if you HIV have any disease take your meds that'd be my advice you know from you know don't you think that's been remarkable that I was undetectable for many yeah, I mean, years until uh, I came to New York and then I'll I stopped you, taking it it's with all the late feel like I'm hanging out all night yeah, get to take yeah. my medicine you know, well, so you I know. blame myself. I don't blame nobody but me for that. You know. Well, Johnny, you know we we need you with us. Know. You know, so I know, man. I think anybody who's said. watching this, you you know, if you any of you guys have some support or uh, help for Johnny, you know, I I contact me because I'll, I'll put you in touch with Johnny. You know, because um, uh, you know, we uh, we can't afford to to lose you greats. You know, thank you. Appreciate. That, you thank know. you so very kindly for that. And, and thank you so much. And for, I don't. F I for feel like I should not. If you're gonna tell it all, don't. I don't keep that for the. I think people should know. I'm not ashamed of it. But you, because at one time when, you know, it used to be stigmatized as being a gay disease. It's just like cancer is another disease. As long as you take your meds and do right, I would know because I was undetectable for years. I was doing. New York, I don't know what it is. I'm not. It's just the fast life in New York. Being new in New York, I just was slipping. And then I went when I first came in. Believe it or not, when I came in 2010, my immune system because I had stopped take, and I wound up in the hospital at uh, Bellevue for about almost a month. Wow. Yeah. My immune system had dropped because I stopped. You know, I wasn't taking my medicine. wasn't making my doctor's appointment. Hanging out late four and five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You know? Well, well O'Neal. You hate to put you know. the blame on it, but it's just the truth. Yeah. That's just the way it happened, you know. Well, O'Neal, let's, I'm let's get you better, place. man. I'm ready to, to do whatever I need to do, and I would, I'm not. I don't. You cannot take life for granted, man. Look at Mulgrew. Yeah, you know, uh, especially with the, with the death of Mulgrew Miller, you know, just just learn you know, on the jazz scene. It's uh, it's very important to take care of. Your health, especially if you have uh, pre pre uh, disposition, you know things that are going on, you know diseases and, and such, you know. Um, but let's see what happens with with uh, HIV because I, in the past couple months I've seen some 
amazing things happen, cures and, and things like that. They were saying about Ant over not over in Europe, but they think they found a cure over in Copenhagen. Did you hear about that? I heard about this one one person who uh, they had the disease, and it, you know through their cure, it, you know the person was cured. You know through through the way that they were handling it. So you know I. Uh, let's put our hope in the fact that there there will be a a cure and you know, better medications and, and things like that. You know. Well, I know what it's like to to feel like not having HIV, to feel and live a normal life, man. When you're not doing what you're supposed to do, I never see just like right now. I feel pretty good with the exception of this hernia. You know, if I didn't had a hernia, I actually feel healthy. You know, although when you HIV and don't take your medicine. It makes you lose a lot of weight, and plus, it makes you lose your appetite. See, and I know I'm so skinny right now, I could do sit-ups under the door. <laughs> I thought I had a little humor to it. I mean, that was, I said it, but um, I still thank God that I'm here. And, and Mugru, you know, Dev kind of really gave me a wake-up call because he had no bad habits. He didn't smoke, he didn't drink, he didn't do anything. And I've noticed about the history of this music, when it comes to, when you look at the timeline of a lot of the great legends, most of them, when they were doing hardcore drugs, they tend to have a little more longevity. When they, try, when they become cross-addictive and stop using the drugs, they resort to alcohol, and that's what kills them. It's the alcohol. Yeah, alcohol no, really, is, uh, that's something to You just to read the history, up. but yeah. it's something that's... It's, I mean, you look at Train and all of God, they survived. I hate to just put that out there, but it's the, just a lot of truth and validity to it. Sure, They sure. all, when they stopped trying to go clean with the drugs, they most of them turned into alcoholics, and that's what kills them. That's what kills them, yeah. I mean, uh, and, you know, something about, a lot of cats don't talk about this, but something about the hang late at night, and you do that too too much and not not enough sleep, you know. Oh, the body's I, get, no, I get my rhythms. rest now. Yeah. I do get. Now I tell you. Yeah. In fact, I just did a record date uh, today, yesterday actually. Man, I stayed out at the producer's house. Man, I went into a serious coma. I went to bed about four thirty this morning. I didn't wake up to about four o'clock this afternoon. That's great, man. That's a, some man, that quality was some sleep. Some of the best. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hanging, and leaving smalls or the fat yeah. cats at four or five o'clock. You feel like a lot of times if you don't go out, you're gonna be missing something. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's a that's something that's about to change. That's a good head. segue because you know I really want to you know highlight this for you know for Spike Wilner you know what he's doing with the live feed, being able to access this club from your from your living room. That's gonna be important in the future. You mm -hmm. know, cats who can't necessarily make it out, they can still feel like they're a part. Well, you know, involved. speaking of that, I have a fan club in Atlanta. They get together every Sunday. We're going to watch the Johnny O'Neill show. <laughs> There's about 12 or 13 of them. They wow. Get, this is a, I got a lot of fans in Atlanta. Yeah. And they get together. Well, we get, you know, we got to watch Johnny's son. And you know what's so, what's so gratifying about that? They said, Johnny, we have saw a lot of your shows. They said, it's always exciting. Even if we hear some of the same tunes, you always got a different way you play them. And they say we like because we never know what you're gonna do. We enjoy that. Yeah. They get together and watch me on the big screen. And <laughs> they say we come watch the Johnny O'Neill. Cause I guess what I do is a show. Spike calls it a show. Yeah, it's really, really something, and you really. And I'm not uh, have compromising of, my skills. It's yeah. still show business. You really have a unique way of uh, leading the crowd and, and, and singing. And I don't, you know? you know what, but I'm going to tell you one thing about I don't play to get house. When I go up on the bandstand, it's like, ladies and gentlemen, come on this journey with me. I'm inviting you to come on this journey. Because you could tell when guys trying to get house. Of course, we all have little short things that might get the house. But for the most part, I'm so into the moment of playing. Yeah. It ain't about getting house. You yeah, know? sure. It's for the love of the art. First, yeah, yeah. foremost, you know. Sure, sure. Yeah, man. Well, thanks so much for uh, going on this uh, adventure on your life, this musical journey, talking right. about uh, some of your experiences. Um, if there was one piece of advice you would just instill to people watching this interview about the jazz life, the music life, 
what would it be? Well, first of all, that's a good question. That's something that you got to put up with a lot. You have to not think of finances. You got to do it because you love it. A lot of times there's not no money in jazz. You really play jazz because it's the only true, only true art form. And, um, and jazz musicians actually don't get a lot more notoriety until they get become older. I find if you look at the history, a lot of them don't start getting a lot of play until after they get in my age group. If you look at the history, Miles and, and Blakey and all them, they was in my age group at the time when I was with them. That's when they was getting more notoriety. Yeah. Would yeah. you agree? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because um, there's this like gap mm -hmm. from 30 to 50. Right. Where cats are there and they're working hard, but nobody's really paying attention to them. When you get in your 50s, you consider then as a veteran. Yeah. That's when you start, people take more notice. One of the most gratifying moments, I must say, in my career is when I did in the movie Ray. I, in fact, you know, I've, you know, of course, Art Tatum was my greatest influence. I never imagined that I would be asked to play him in a movie. And I, like I said, when I got the call for it, it was, I was like on the road. I was in Birmingham, Alabama, and I get a call early morning. It was a lady from Hollywood. She said, Johnny O'Neill? I said, yes. She said, you was highly recommended by Oliver Jones and Oscar Peterson as the play in the upcoming movie, which initially it was called Unchained My Heart. Ray died during the filming of it, so they switched it to Ray. A lot of people don't know that. I said... I said, who is this? Quit playing. I'm half asleep. So I looked at my call ID and I saw uh, the California Exchange area code. I said, Miss, oh, I'm really sorry. I said, and you know, of course I was at a loss for words. I said, yeah. uh, 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 okay. I said, when? Can you come do the screen test today? <laughs> the same day she said, I'll call you back in a couple hours and get you a ticket. Yeah, I was because I was very close to New Orleans. They called me in a couple hours. I went to New Orleans and did the screen test. And at that time, I was wearing a beard. Now they cut my hair and they gave did the makeup, and I sat down and played. And I did my eye like this Tatum, because <laughs> yeah. they thought they was gonna have to put some kind of calisthenics. I said no, I can do it myself. Yeah, they didn't even let me finish the tune. They said you got the part. I was like Fred Sanford about to have it. Oh my God, like. And I tell you, Jamie Foxx was like a little kid on that on that session. He he's another one. He, you know, of course, our Tatum was Ray Charles' idol. So for him to be exposed, and I'm gonna tell you, man, I was totally prepared like a boxer. I was prepared, knowing I'm playing our Tatum, I couldn't be Tatum. But yeah, Jamie, Jamie was so nice to me, man. He was like, a, man, he could really play the piano. He's a classical pianist. So when we weren't filming, I was entertaining a lot of the cast that in the studio. So I got to know a lot of those actors and actresses. Man, they was all in awe just seeing me. I'm doing my show like the Smalls in it. And you know, they of course, you know, they artists, so they was very intuitive and really, really listening. Jamie Foxx closed the lid on the piano and got up on top of the piano. And he said, you know, he sat there on the piano I showed him some chords. He sung with me, and this guy recorded. We was recording everything. Those Pachiasu people was following us around. He, uh, Jamie, sung some songs with me. He, he go, oh, then he pulled a Wanda character. He said, oh, child, you gonna make me rock your world playing all that piano. <laughs> it was great, man. Yeah. He said, you gonna make me rock your world playing all this piano like this, man. <laughs> He sat and played for me. I remember the tune he sung. I played for him. Everything must change. Yeah. You know. And wow. he, it was so gratifying. He was really hurt that they edited me out quite a bit in that movie because the movie was more about Ray Charles. So I had actually four songs, but they cut me out. But at least I made it to the silver screen. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's great, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, thanks, so I thought thanks I for doing that. I would share that, you know? too. That was yeah, something I thought yeah. was important to share. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Johnny, um, 
thanks so much for doing this. Well, it was my extreme pleasure, and thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, you told me you're just about to to uh, be releasing another record, a solo record. Yeah. Uh, and the really truth, maybe, it's right? About the truth, <laughs> The yeah. truth. That's cool, man. Um, and it's going to be a memory of, of Marlboro. Great, great. It, you know, Fantastic. memory of Marlboro Miller. All right, Johnny. Well, thanks again. All right. Well, thank you, man. It was indeed a pleasure. A pleasure. And you're a very good interviewer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This is, I'm paying total homage to one of my very best friends and one of the most brilliant pianists that ever lived, the great Margaret Miller. And this was one of his favorite songs. In fact, he used to always ask me to sing this song with him. This is great Duke Ellington, Don't You Know I Care. Don't you know I care. Or don't you care to know If you know I care How could you hurt me so Darling, you are a part Of every breath I take Will you break my heart Or give my heart a break I can't figure out what love is all about where do I fit into your skin? Am I wasting time? Please tell me, cause I'm down to my last dream. Won't you please be fair? Love me or let me go Don't you know I care Or don't you care